All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Dan, and together with uh, Anita, we work on the Linux user space team at uh, Meta. And today we'll be talking about our experiences maintaining the system, the uh, back part in hyperscale and deploying it into production at uh, Meta. Next slide. Um, so quickly, what we'll be talking about, first we'll discuss the backport in hyperscale itself, then we'll go uh, ahead and talk about the uh, deployment of the backport at uh, Meta itself in the production fleet, and finally we'll finish with some of the fun bugs that we've uh, found while releasing new versions uh, of the system the backport into the fleet at uh, Meta. Next slide. Also, if you have questions at any point, uh, feel free to interrupt Anita uh, or me, and, and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, so we'll start with the uh, backport in uh, hyperscale. So, uh, like David mentioned, or you know, um, we maintain the backport uh, of system D in hyperscale uh, generally because we're quite heavily invested in system D at Meta. Uh, we regularly we also contribute heavily upstream, and we regularly adopt new features and new releases. Uh, and to avoid having to wait for a new uh, release of CentOS Stream in order to get a new version of SystemD, uh, we maintain the backport so that we can uh, adopt new features as they become available in new SystemD releases. Um, the hyperscale stake has pretty much allowed us to do this all in the open, and so anyone can take the uh, the backport of the RPM and install it in their own system and it'll be the same uh, it'll be the same as what we're running in uh, in the fleet at, same as what we're running in uh, in the fleet at uh, meta next slide please um the backboard itself uh, it consists out of a few different parts the first part is the staging repository this is pretty much a git repository on pager where we try to uh, which we try to use to streamline the, the batch management for the backboard. So instead of maintaining individual batch files in the RPM repo uh, itself, we do it all in a Git repository. The Git repository is pretty much a fork of systemd, uh, where whenever we do a new release, we pick the latest point release from the systemd stable repository uh, from systemd itself on GitHub. And then we apply all uh, any patches we need on top, uh, any backports we need on top, and uh, sometimes uh, some uh, in progress PRS uh, pull requests as well. Uh, the systemd stable repository from systemd on GitHub is basically where systemd maintains its uh, public releases, um, where it backports bug fixes from its stream and makes new point releases from time to time. Uh, and whenever we want to do a new release, we pick the latest point release and we uh, base ourselves on top of that. Um, like I said, we do a few patches uh, and backports on top, but we generally try to keep them to a minimum. Uh, and whenever we do uh, do a backport or a, or a patch, we try to also propose it upstream um, so that we don't have to maintain any custom code on top of the uh, system, the uh, upstream release. What we do so, uh, on top of that sometimes, however, is we uh, take uh, in-progress PRs, pull requests, that haven't been merged yet, um, and we merge them into a company-specific branch in the staging repository. And this is generally to allow experimentation with the uh, pull request internally uh, on, in our own fleet to validate the changes, especially when they, there are larger changes and there are uh, backwards compatibility uh, guarantees that come with that. We want to make sure that the patch actually works and does what it uh, does what we expect uh, it to, even at a uh, large scale before we merge it into systemd and it becomes available in a public release. And then the company specific branches allow us to uh, get the get that code into our fleet without having to make, make it available for uh, every one of Hyperscale's users. Uh, each of the company-specific branches also comes with their own uh, build of the RPM, 
which can then be deployed. Uh, if everything goes well, the patch is uh, merged upstream after validation. Uh, it becomes available in a public release, and then eventually it flows back into the main hyperscale uh, branch and can be used by everyone. Uh, one thing we're still missing in the page repository, but which we what we want to add in the future is we want to integrate the uh, upstream system DCI so that um, we can more or less run all the integration tests uh, from upstream on any pull requests or commits to the staging repository as well. And this would help us make sure that even if we uh, have to do a one-off custom patch uh, or backport a, a PR or uh, any of that, uh, that all the production, uh, all the upstream tests uh, from upstream still pass and uh, we didn't break anything. Uh, next slide, please. Um, once the page repository is in order, we've branched off a new release and applied all the patches we need. We go ahead and we uh, move on to building the RPM itself. Um, the RPM spec for the hyperscale backport is maintained in the same uh, repository as the CentOS stream spec for systemd. Uh, however, we do differ quite heavily from the uh, CentOS stream spec because we decided to base ourselves off the Fedora Rawhide spec uh, instead. Why do we do this? Uh, generally, the, uh, because we pull in the latest releases from upstream, we found that the Fedora Rawhide spec uh, provides us with a much better baseline uh, primarily because like, we don't need as many backports of uh, upstream patches because we're based on the latest uh, systemd release and any backports for bug fixes that need to happen are done by uh, by systemd itself in a systemd stable repository so the there's generally a, a vastly reduced need for backports and the other thing is that um, we automatically pick up any changes in the systemd spec that need to happen uh, due to new features or changes uh, in new systemd releases. Uh, the Fedora spec already includes these for us, and we don't need to add them ourselves to the spec. Uh, the big difference between the Fedora spec and the CentOS stream spec is, of course, the uh, layout of the RPM repository. So CentOS stream uh, uses the CentOS layout, and Fedora uses the flat diskit layout. Uh, until recently, we used the CentOS stream layout as well because the flat layout wasn't supported uh, by the CentOS RPM uh, built in from. Uh, but recently, it has become supported, and so we switched over to it. And this generally helped us a lot to keep uh, our diff uh, with the Fedora spec as small as possible because we could just start using Git itself to diff between the two branches uh, and get a very, very easily, uh, very quick overview of the differences between the two. And once you have that, it was very easy to uh, start removing differences that were not necessary one by one to keep, uh, to generally make our, our spec look more than like the Fedora one. And this is useful because we generally want to avoid deviating from upstream because the more we look like upstream, the better our, uh, the more useful our bug reports will be. Uh, whenever we run into uh, an issue or problem. Uh, this change we probably make to the Fedora spec is um, that we simply change where the sources come from. The Fedora spec pulls from the system the stable repository, and we uh, pull from our visual repository uh, branches instead. Uh, next slide, please. Um, once the uh, RPM changes have been made, we uh, use CVS to build new versions of the RPM. Um, in this case, both uh, we have both the main hyperscale RPMs and then we have the Facebook-specific RPMs. Uh, and the Facebook-specific RPMs usually include some of the upstream PRs that we're still trying to test in production before merging them. Uh, two examples are we are uh, the ZRAM uh, PR, which is for a feature in the kernel, was recently merged. Uh, and before it was available, we still wanted to test it in our own kernel. And so we uh, had a PR upstream open for uh, that feature, but we didn't want to merge it upstream yet because the kernel feature hadn't merged. But we were able to uh, land the uh, system DPR in the Facebook specific branch. Uh, so that we could test it on our production fleet. 
before merging the kernel feature and the systemd feature. Um, so once we want, we have uploaded the RPMs uh, and they're available in the testing repositories, we can uh, try, uh, we can go ahead and like uh, validate our changes. Uh, one way to do this uh, is with MakeOSI, which is an image builder uh, and it has support for custom repositories. So you can easily point it at the hyperscale repositories and it will uh, build you images that, uh, build, it'll, it'll build you hyperscale images basically. Uh, these can then be booted in a container via system the end spawn or in a virtual machine with QM or anything else. It's just a regular disk image that you can pass to any uh, virtual machine uh, software and it'll boot it for you. Uh, we can basically use this to test whether the RPM works correctly, just like basically testing the, the, the features. But we can also test RPM specific stuff, like uh, can we upgrade correctly from a base CentOS installation to a hyperscale one? Uh, and we also can use it to test conflicts with other RPMs. So for example, I used this to uh, figure out some file conflicts with the systemd extras uh, RPM, uh, because systemd extras in Appel is backport and systemd time server stuff. Uh, which tend to like you, you can run into uh, conflicts with the system D backport because they both try to manage the same files. And once sometimes files change ownership between packages, and like it's very easy to run into file conflicts. And so MakeOSI was very useful to figure out uh, that we could st resolve the conflicts and make sure we could still install the backport, even if system D extras was installed on a regular CentOS system. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, there's the system of the uh, Like David said, we use OpenShift for uh, as a glorified cron job runner. Um, so, so generally, what we can do is um, for systemd is we try to do a daily build of the RPM from the latest upstream sources uh, to generally try and make sure that we can still build the RPM even with changes from upstream. Um, the other thing we do is keep our mirrors of upstream pull requests in Pager up to date, simply by uh, pulling from GitHub and pushing to the Pager repository. Uh, we try to keep a mirror of upstream pull requests in Pager as well to avoid having a dependency on the GitHub branches, uh, which could change at any moment. Uh, and having the mirror in Pager gives us a little bit more certainty. Uh, one thing we're missing really is alerting on this. So we want to uh, basically get notified earlier and like uh, when something goes wrong with these builds, but we don't have that yet. So uh, that's one thing we're looking to add so that we can uh, intervene when something goes wrong with uh, either the RPM build or keeping the mirrors up to date. Uh, next slide. Hello. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, briefly recap a little bit about how we deploy both the systemd RPMs that we use at Meta and the hyperscale general version. So like Don mentioned, um, first we just make sure all the changes are pushed to git.centos and pager. And then once those are pushed, we use the uh, CentOS um, community build system to build both the um, general hyperscale one and the meta HS plus FB tagged versions. Um, and after that, we tag both of these versions for testing. So at this point, they're available for anyone to just um, download and start testing them. On the hyperscale um, kind of systemd maintainer side, we perform just basic sanity checks on both versions. And at this point, we actually tag the meta version as stable. So what this does is it signs the RPMs and then pushes them to the mirrors, which allows us to actually import it into our internal repositories and start rolling it to the production fleet. Um, and then once the production rollout is done um, and we just double check um, any sanity issues, we tag the general hyperscale one for release. So. Um, You'll see the benefits of why we actually roll the meta one first before we tag the hyperscale one. When I start talking about some of the issues we're able to catch on meta's production fleet. 
Um, whenever I talk about like the meta rollout, people always ask like, how does it work? Um, I can't give you the secret sauce, but I can tell you a little bit about what happens. So we have 10 phases and we always start with a canary phase. So the canary tier is a mixture of test related workloads. So these are um, test workloads or like RC workloads that teams are able to donate to the cause. <laughs> um, and then we have a handful of production workloads that run in the canary as well. And so after the canary, we roll out um, daily a percentage of the fleet. So starting one, five, um, and usually most issues will show up by the time it reaches 50% of the fleet. Um, I guess that's the benefit of having millions of servers. Um, and during this time, we actually monitor a range of different graphs. Um, more recently, we've added more charts for monitoring the performance regressions in various daemons. Um, we rely heavily on whether containers can start up because they rely heavily on the uh, systemd dbus API. Um, and we also use Chef to configure the fleet, which also relies heavily on using systemd to run uh, various services and things like that. OK, so now I'm going to talk about some of the interesting things we found, um, both in the CI and during the actual rollout process. So I'm going to split this section up into two classes of issues. Um, the first one I'm going to call like build time that we can pretty easily catch in CIs. And then the second half will be like actual uh, rollout issues. So the first one um, is actually pretty old. Uh, <laughs> there is a missing comma added or like removed, I guess. Um, and uh, we noticed that this broke the build with seccomp disabled. So the meta build of uh, systemd is actually one of the few places, I guess, where we try to build with seccomp disabled. And so uh, Davide found, reported, and fixed this um, back in the day. Um, here's another old but simple one. Um, one thing the uh, upstream systemd contributors like to do is, is uh, adopt like new features pretty as soon as they're available. So like in kernel, um, in GCC, sometimes Mason, the build system. Um, but they're actually documented to be able to build with older versions. So in this case, um, they switched the way one of the elements was initialized, and that caused an issue when we were trying to build on CentOS 7. Um, this is an example of how uh, we've kind of been running the CI for a long time, even before Hyperscale. And um, we basically just took that CI and put it into Hyperscale. So we're able to continue to catch these uh, build time issues that um, differ when we build in the upstream CI versus in the actual like CentOS distribution CI. Um, and then here's just more of the same where um, upstream uses the latest Mason to build its system the upstream package. But in this case, um, in CentOS, I don't remember which version this was, probably seven at this point, um, it wasn't building on the older version that they were documented to support. Um, besides just building the CI, we actually just run the unit test as well, because why not? Um, and so in this case, Upstream had a test that was using a newer um, feature of libfdisk, and it wasn't supported on the version of CentOS we were using. And so uh, we were able to, I think in the end, we decided to just bump the version of libfdisk required for this feature. Okay. Oh. I really like this one, but I just like bugs that are annoying to, <laughs> to uh, debug. Um, so, I, so besides just finding um, issues in systemd, being able to build a core component like systemd pretty regularly, we also are able to find and fix any issues in uh, dependent components in the CentOS ecosystem. Um, so in this case, uh, we noticed that systemd LTO build was failing. Um, and this was because there was a bad uh, bin utils backport. Um, actually, at the time, the backport wasn't bad, but in upstream, it was actually reverted the commit. So that's why it actually broke the LTO build. Um, this is an example of how uh, just running a CI on like the uh, latest systemd CentOS 
build system. Uh, we can find and fix related bugs in the system. And actually, I got some nice swag for reporting this bug. Latest release of 251. Um, like I mentioned before, we found a few conflicts with the system, the extras uh, RPM in the Bell. And simply by, uh, well, we had to go ahead and uh, actually debug these uh, a little bit. And eventually we um, fixed it by doing an upstream PR um, to move some of the network D, system network D, uh, temp files uh, into a separate file so that we could move them to the system D network D package, which ended up resolving the conflicts. Next slide. So those were like the issues we managed to catch before uh, beforehand before releasing the uh, the new system D version into the fleet at Meta. Uh, and the following issues will be more of the things that we found while actually deploying the uh, the release on a, a larger number of machines. Next slide. Um, one of the issues we found in two five one. This was still relatively minor, uh, but we started seeing a large number of BPF initialization errors from um, the system itself. And this was pretty much fixed by uh, dropping the logging level to debug in a few cases um, to avoid uh, excessively spamming the logs when uh, a specific BPF feature was not available in the, in the kernel. Next slide. And another one we found with this release is that um, when we, I think we got to three or four percent of the machines, uh, we got a report from users that uh, a specific service running system the analyze was uh, starting to fail an awful lot because of a uh, regression in the access status from a specific command. Uh, this was introduced uh, in a Somewhat unrelated comment, and it slipped through where the default has had us change from zero to one for a specific command, which caused a service to start failing. Um, and the uh, fix was to uh, fix the regression and make sure that uh, analyze kept returning zero instead of one for that specific scenario. Next slide. Here's another uh, situation where one of our internal CI teams used the system call filter feature of system D. Um, and so what happened was they, after system D added some new syscalls, they realized there was a different handling between whether you configured those system calls through unit files versus when you set them through dbus. Um, in system D this happened because the flags were different be between both um, setting versions. And so uh, we were able to quickly find and fix that um, before the rollout got too far. Um, and then in this case, we had some storage host that was using one of the um, systemd mount options in fstab, and they had to be uh, escaping to make sure their mount paths were correct. Um, however, at, during this release, one of the tree wide changes uh, modified how that utility worked, and so it broke the character escaping, um, and it broke the mount for uh, basically a lot of hosts. Okay, so I'd say those um, past few issues that we just talked about in this section, um, you could actually catch these with unit tests. And whenever we upstream the fix, we also add accordingly um, new, new unit tests, new integration tests. Um, the only thing that makes this like more of a big fleet issue is that when a feature is even broken in like a slightly different way um, across like millions of engineers, um, they're gonna like yell at you and stuff. <laughs> so um, that's, it kind of increases the urgency um, and kind of blows up the uh, intensity of these issues. Um, but this next one um, I'd say is kind of like a true big fleet issue. So in this case, uh, system D, I would say, accidentally added additional accesses to EFI variables, and those can actually become quite expensive if you, um, you know, access them a lot. So in this case, MySQL had noticed that um, 
During periods of chef runs, which we do every 15 minutes, there were micro stalls in their uh, workload. And that's pretty unacceptable. MySQL was pretty performance sensitive. And so uh, we were able to quickly find and fix this issue um, just by caching the EFI variables. Um, this one's pretty interesting because it kind of shows a little bit about why we even use the latest upstream systemd at all. So in this case, systemd had changed the default to mount cgroups2 with memory recursive prot, and we noticed that this increased out of memory events in certain workloads. And so from there, we, um, we were able to debug this with our various teams, and we tracked this down to a kernel issue. A uh, pretty subtle issue with the handling of like memory.min and memory.low and reclaims. Um, in this case, being able to deploy new defaults like this to our fleet quickly, we're able to fix this in the kernel before most users even saw this issue. Um, and this last one's near and dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time on it. Um, there was a very subtle memory regression in systemd journal D that I would think most users would probably never see. Um, in this case, it occurred because on our fleet, we log quite a bit. And then journal D runs for you know, uh, a long time. So in this case, we saw a uh, memory regression where normally system in journal D would be using maybe 20 megabytes of memory. But we noticed that over time, this would grow up to like 300 megabytes of anonymous memory usage. Um, so we were able to uh, find and fix this. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually did a scale talk on this last month, so you can find about uh, how we debug this. But this is another example of how like um, small problems, even just like a small memory growth, could become huge problems on a fleet um, of our size. OK, so that's um, all we had for now. Uh, and now we'll take questions. So the question was, what is the latency between, um, a, for example, the commit that uh, pushed the change to read EFI variables more frequently versus when we actually caught the issue? So um, at this point, we don't deploy the latest systemd to production workloads, um, as in we don't deploy the main branch. We only deploy the releases um, and the point releases. So um, at, it was already um, pushed to a release before we caught it. I understand correctly, you're asking like um, what, whether we'd be able to get to a point where we could um, maybe push the systemd main branch uh, more frequently and um, how beneficial this would be to Meta and I guess the community at large. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll also let Dan speak. I personally would love to push the main branch, um, but I think at this point we don't actually have the support power to do it um, because the benefit of us staying 
uh, upstream first and you know sticking pretty closely to the releases is that we can actually find and fix these issues quickly. And so if we're able to push the main branch more frequently, um, we'd be able to find and fix these issues even faster. Um, and then Don, if you have any questions. Um, well, I would like to say shout out to all the Arch Linux users that catch all the issues before they appear in our fleet. Um, so pretty much what Anita said. Uh, we are, I generally notice that like whenever we do a new release uh, and it gets deployed, usually first to Arch Linux or, or uh, Fedora Ride, um, there are a lot of, are a lot of bug reports that then get fixed uh, and appear in new system stable releases. So I think at the moment we're still relying quite a bit on all those issues being caught um, before we roll out to um, production at Mana. So I feel that if we wanted to start pushing the main branch correctly, uh, we would need to probably up the testing story quite a bit in systemd. So uh, because there's still like, uh, quite a bit, quite a few issues that slip through into a release and then like uh, are fixed afterwards. So um, we would need to have something like in place to catch a few more of those issues before um, or before like PRs get merged, before we can actually like regularly start or could like start considering uh, actually pushing the main branch. Although of course we could like do it to a very small number of machines, but. Um, we would need to like very uh, keep track of uh, of all the regressions popping up there. So we would also probably need a better way to just monitor a system a running system with system D and then just find things that are going wrong automatically instead of having to look manually. Uh, I'm not sure something like that would also probably help to catch issues um, in a way that doesn't require too much of our time. And then we could report them upstream and then get them fixed, of course. Uh, Neil made a good point that I forgot. So systemd upstream as a project doesn't make any guarantees about uh, ABI compatibility or like um, any of the property compatibilities uh, between commits on the main branch. But once they're tagged for release, um, each of the properties, the behaviors, and API is supposed to be considered stable. 
especially like the Dbus APIs. So, um, yeah, yeah. So the question was, have we considered uh, kind of trying throwing more chaos into our testing system to test more of these difficult issues related to like maybe performance and um, just, uh, other timing issues and behaviors and such? Um, let's see. Um, you know, that's interesting. I haven't. So I was so focused for a long time on even just getting uh, a good CI going within Meta that I hadn't, the, the more, the performance issues kind of start popping up more recently because we kind of killed the low hanging fruit. So I think that is a good angle to consider in the future. Um, Don, do you have any comments about this? Um, well, I know that especially performance is hard to, well, there, it's hard to, set up the environment required to trigger these issues. Um, so we do catch some of them in production at Meta, but we also regularly get uh, users. I think System D Network D gets a lot of uh, performance uh, bug reports from users that are just like running System D Network D with millions of routes, uh, or maybe millions is a bit much actually, but thousands of routes. Um, and like start running into performance issues, which we sim which I mean, it's a it's a, an avenue of testing that's kind of missing almost completely from the integration test upstream. But it would definitely make sense to somehow start uh, trying to trigger these kind of issues more more often and in, in before we actually deploy to production. But I also think that there would be quite a bit of effort required to set up the necessary uh, infrastructure because until very recently most of our integration tests on the CentOS infra were running on not exactly uh, powerful machines which like i mean i guess it's uh, on one hand it's good to catch uh, performance issues but uh, on the other hand if you start like trying to do intensive stuff on those they they, they start blocking up completely so maybe now that we are starting to move to more uh, powerful machines, we can start like, uh, maybe it opens up the avenue for uh, actually starting to do more intensive stuff in the integration tests as well, to, in order to keep a tab on, on performance. But then again, you need a specific monitoring for performance as well uh, in order to catch regressions, because it's not simply a failing test. You need to actually start monitoring how long the test takes and um, whether there's a regression from previous ones uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, performance is definitely harder to test, I think, than, than correct behavior. So the question was, uh, when we have like all these millions of developers like kind of uh, clamoring at us to fix issues or when they run into a bug with the new system D, um, are we able to roll back or do we just try to quickly uh, kind of like sub zero fix forward or something like that? 
Um, so depending on the issue, um, we are able to pretty quickly fix forward just by pulling in a new RPM. Um, but rolling back is also pretty easy as well. So we actually live upgrade systemd on all of our hosts. We don't need to reboot. And so when we downgrade, it's the same way. Um, so it's just the same. We just change the version, toggle the phase that we're on, and then um, we can downgrade pretty easily. Um, yeah, we can always go back. Um, we can also like pin certain workloads to certain versions. Um, we really try not to do that because then it means we need more people to maintain all those pins and things like that. So uh, we really do try to unpin and fix forward as quickly as we can. But we're not going to like stay up till midnight doing that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>